You know, here in Boston, the All right, so let's get started here. My name is Zach Johnson, I'm the Dean of Students, and we had a lot of people signed up today, but due to, to COVID and travel restrictions, we're always unsure about who's gonna be here live and who's gonna be online. So we this is sort of a live streamed event, so we'll, we'll try to keep moving here. And I'm gonna open us up in prayer and just sort of introduce the day. I'll be sort of trying to guide people around campus today as the different events go on. And the first thing we have is a, an introduction from Sattler's founder and their leadership. So we'll, I'm really excited to hear about that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. I thank you for this place and as well as the future students and the current students. I pray that today would bring copious amounts of clarity to uh, students trying to make a decision about their future. And I pray that all their questions could be answered here. And in your son's name, we pray, amen. All right. So I'm gonna introduce Sattler's founder, Dr. Finney Caravilla, for the, an opening remarks on the mission and vision of Sattler. All right, thanks. Thank you for that. Great to be with all of you here. I, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully getting to meet a number of you.
So as, as uh, Brother Zach said, I'm on the board of trustees for Sattler, and I'm going to just walk you through in the next 15 minutes or so uh, about why we are here, what we do, and why we think you should be excited about coming to Sattler and spending time with us. There we go. All right, so we, we use this as a tagline, equipping Jesus' peaceful revolution. Um, I want to start by, by saying that I do think that we're in a time of crisis. And I'm going to illustrate this here with this graph. This came from the Gallup organization. So Gallup is a, a very widely known pollster organization. It's just looking in the United States at what is happening with regard to overall church membership. You don't have to be an Einstein to recognize there's an alarming trend here. So uh, I was born here in the 70s, and it used to be the case that average uh, attendance at a church, they asked this, the question church, synagogue, or mosque, but of course most of these are, are churchgoers. But you can see it is just precipitously falling, and for the first time in the history of America, we are now under 50%. Uh, and this poll was done in 2020, and it continues to decline. I don't know about you, but when I see this, I think like, wow, what we're doing clear, clearly is not working. Uh, Saller began when I was here. I lived in this dorm. This dorm is called Mather House. It's one of the, the dorms at Harvard College. I lived as an RA for seven years among the Harvard students, and I had the opportunity to watch hundreds and hundreds of students go through their four-year college experience. I was a pre-med uh, advisor there. And the official statistics, uh, this is averaging across four different polls, but the official statistics are between 70 to 80 percent of young people who were practicing their faith by the time they're done with college, by the time they're in their 20s, are no longer. That is like, again, like that ought to be a number that just causes us to say, stop, something's not working, we need to address this uh, immediately. So, so where are we today? I think it's safe to say that most churches of all stripes are facing a crisis of infertility. Very few are succeeding at evangelizing and discipling those on the outside. And the analogy that I often use comes from Dawson Trotman, who says that, well, if you were married for many years and you were infertile, you'd be pretty alarmed. You'd go to the doctor, you'd want to seek out medical treatment, you would, you'd be asking people to pray for you. You wouldn't just be okay with that. And in the same way, we ought to be alarmed. When we, see, when we see tables and charts like this, we ought to say, stop, this is not okay. This is cause to do something different. And uh, Dawson Trotman, who's the founder of Navigators, says that spiritual infertility similarly is caused by lack of union, disease, or immaturity, just like it would be the case in the realm of marriage. But unfortunately, very few people are troubled the, many people have come to believe that infertility is normal and the pattern of acts is brushed aside and unbelief takes root, which of course then decreases the investment in evangelism and discipleship, which makes the problem worse. So that's, that's where we're at. And I, I do think that reproduction, healthy reproduction, is a powerful barometer to health. So I am, I'm a physician by training and I can say this, although you don't need to be a doctor to know this, you have to have your organ systems all operating in health in order to have a baby. It's a very, very involved process. Something is wrong. So, so we, what we're going to do is uh, illustrate this in a couple of different ways. It's a multifactorial problem. We're not going to say it's just all on one, on one item, but there are a number of causes of, of this decline here. So again, lack of union, disease, or immaturity. But let's think for a moment about the general problem of, of sexual purity in particular. Again, churches of all stripes, uh, this is not particular to any one group or denomination, are facing a massive crisis that is little discussed. Uh, young men and young women um, are entangled in the sin of pornography. It is just as much an issue that women face, although in lower percentages. Um, I myself have collected uh, poll data on this because I want to know in the circles that I travel among, how, how's it going? It's, it's better than it is in the broader world, but still a lot of improvement needed here. Um, 
Kingdom Fellowship Weekend is one example of where Ken Miller and I ran a poll and collected data there. Primary data, I still have the slips of paper uh, that, that I, I look at from time to time. 30% of the young men there have an ongoing problem. Um, at a Bible school I used to speak at in Holmes County, it was 46.7. Within the Anabaptist churches, it's around 60 to 65%. Within the Protestant evangelical churches, it's between 80 to 90%. So, I mean, it's, it's a big, big problem in, in churches today. This is not okay. We should be distressed about this. We should say, hey, stop, pull the fire alarm here. In addition, here's, that's one problem. Let's go to another one. There's a, a tremendous crisis of apathy towards the Word of God. Um, in one of the classes that I teach here, we open up with a quiz asking a bunch of just diagnostic questions about how people do with understanding Scripture. And if I were to ask you, describe the main message of the book of Amos. What's the relationship between Haggai and Zechariah? What happened in Ephesus versus Philippi versus Galatia that made the letters so different? Most people do very, very poorly on these kinds of questions because there's not really an engagement or a passion for Scripture. Uh, it's not hard to answer these things if you have a framework, if you really understand the Scriptures, but this illustrates that we have sunk very far there. All right, so how do we stop these problems? They're, they're happening. How do, we, how do we stop them? The first thing is, hey, we got to be real. we got to be honest and say, let's admit where we're at. As I said, this is not particular to any one group. This is a crisis of our, of our time. Step two is we got to do something different. <laughs> we got to take some risks. Um, by definition, doing the same thing again and again, it's not going to produce a different result. So, so we have to, to take some risks. And uh, I work in healthcare investing, and this is true in all facets of life, but in life, reward is proportional to risk. You play it safe, do the same thing. Okay, it's not taking a lot of risk. You're not going to get a lot of reward either. And we have to ask, and you know, I know for a lot of people to think about coming to Boston, uh, which is far from home, to stretch themselves in this, in this way is a challenge. Are we willing to venture out from what's comfortable to what is stretching? I love this passage here. I think about this passage often. It's in Ephesians 3. Now it's, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. This, this line here that says that God is able to and wants to do more than we ask or think, I think that's amazing. I think that's just something that should just floor us. Uh, there is, uh, there's an individual who has examined, he's a Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL, who looks at individuals and their physical capacity, and he has data to suggest that we're running at about 5% of your potential. So if, if, um, if you say you can do five push-ups, okay? So in actuality, you could do five times 20. You could do 100 push-ups, if you believe it or not. Um, and of course, that's in the physical realm. I believe it's true in the spiritual as well. But we're not really pushing ourselves and taking risks to become the people that God wants us to be. Well, how do we get there? Um, I love this quote from Abraham Lincoln who says, Give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. The answer isn't just to immediately jump in and try to do things in a frenetic way, but it's to prepare ourselves, just like we see in Scripture in the lives of people like Jesus and Paul and Moses. All right, so how, how do we at Sattler uh, address these problems? There's really three problems uh, that we are addressing here. So the first is the core curriculum. I mentioned that we have a deficiency right now in just biblical engagement and really being committed to the Word of God and the historic faith. I can say without, without any hesitation that we have the best core curriculum in the country um, in terms of our, our, our instructors, the content. All that we have is just incredible. And uh, people who go through the Sattler core curriculum are going to be very, very well positioned for a lifetime of Christian service. Discipleship is a major aspect of what we talk about here uh, and what we do. We have a, a program that we call our journey groups as well as other facets that are about engaging and working through all of these issues. And then finally cost. So we call it the three C's, core curriculum, Christian discipleship, and cost. Uh, we're, we're much, much uh, more affordable than our, our peers. 
So we're, uh, we're willing to make that investment because we believe in the, the solution and we believe in the magnitude of the problem. Okay, so we often say that if you think of Sattler, think of one word, discipleship. And if you don't know who Michael Sattler is, you should know him. I was actually just reading uh, one of his letters to Martin Bucer and Wolfgang Capito yesterday. Um, I enjoy reading primary sources, and he's one that I, I read. Uh, he was one of the early Anabaptist leaders. He was author of a document called the Schleitheim Confession, fluent in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And in fact, he gave his trial defense in Latin, believe it or not. Uh, can, you, can you imagine you're being put on trial to be killed and having to give your defense in Latin? And a very educated um, Anabaptist leader. All right. What about this uh, problem of sexual integrity? Uh, so victory is very possible. I just met this morning uh, with, with my freedom group. Uh, we have specialized groups that train men and women in overcoming pornography. And then students themselves then can become mentors and coaches there. Uh, I don't see a lot of people here in the room who are, uh, who are mentors, um, but I know they're on because I saw them this morning there. It's really, really exciting. We've had a number of people start our freedom groups totally addicted and by the time they're done walk in complete freedom we took a poll this is from uh, Zach Johnson did this we pulled our first two classes and this is number of students here on the y-axis asking questions about hey what's going on with your your prayer your time spent in the word fasting purity all those categories and you can see overwhelmingly we have real data showing that our students get a lot better in all these these categories um, so we're we're very very proud of the real world experience that we have been able to accumulate over our four years uh, the the solution to biblical apathy is embodied in this verse here which is also on the seal down on this podium here for God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power love and a sound mind uh, we are very excited about taking what we learn and applying it. And I see some of our, our great professors here. Will Oliver is here, Jonathan McClatchy. Uh, are there others? I'm sure there are others around. You need to talk to them before you leave. We encourage our students to tackle some of the great problems of our day with respect to poverty, injustice, education, health care, sustainable business, Christian discipleship, and world change. We have five majors business, computer science, human biology, history, and biblical studies, as well as a one-year program or a nine-month program that here are the courses that are part of that program. There, uh, I teach a couple of these. Uh, just to show you, are, are they going to get, are, are we going to go to the dorms? Is that part of the day today? That's not. Oh, okay. Uh, this is where our students live who are single, who don't live in Boston, right in the heart of of uh, Boston at the International Guest House, very strategic area where they can meet with especially a lot of internationals. And then for our, our marrieds, they live in this uh, complex here called Malden Towers, which is um, a complex of 200 apartment buildings. Uh, they, they call it the Chinese Indian Friendship Hotel because 90% of the residents, they jokingly call it that, 90% of the residents are from India or China. And there's a lot of really great activity that happens there. Uh, of course, being in Boston, you get to be surrounded by lots of great history. The D.L. Moody plaque is right about over there uh, where he was converted. Uh, lots of amazing history here. Our students also put to, into practice what, they, what they're learning by developing a website called historicfaith.com, which has uh, been a huge highlight to watch people be grounded in this faith. I, I was talking to someone in Africa who lives off of this website. This becomes his, his source of, of uh, instruction and feeding. Uh, this is the bridge. We have an ESL center that is mostly run by our Sattler students. Uh, this is a great opportunity to work with the international students and to uh, teach them English and make friendships there and then get ready to go. Some of you were here last night with our Therefore Go uh, conversation. Um, I'll just illustrate this with one final uh, story here. Um, in the summer of 21, another group of Sattler students went to, if you know the answer, don't say it, what country is this? Anyone know? Right at the top of Lake Victoria, the largest 
tropical lake in the world. This is Uganda. Uh, and uh, I'll just show you some of the pictures of students who went here. Many of them are around um, right now. You can chat with them. Uh, here is Megan Martin. Here's Sabrina. Here's Friedrich. Uh, actually, uh, you can see their majors as well um, that's being shown. Uh, Christy Mast, uh, Seth Pompriand, Stan Cornelson, and Dylan uh, here. So it was a blast. I was actually with them for a part of the time. Uh, here they are in, um, in a corner of Antioch, which is a part of our, uh, there's Dylan, um, uh, a part of our, um, uh, our, our ministry there where we were right across the street from the largest university in, in East Africa, which has 40,000 students. And you all did an amazing job. Dylan worked on, on helping us to develop uh, a business that's going to employ people there um, in terms of stable paychecks, the unemployment rate in Kampala is 50%, 50 percent, five zero uh, percent. It's a, tr a land of tremendous opportunity. Uh, here's everyone uh, working diligently here with some of our African uh, brothers and sisters. This, this young man here actually was brought into the church through the work of a Sattler student. He was baptized and has now really become a leader in the church. Really exciting. And one of the ministries that our, our students are involved in is a pro-life ministry. There's a lot of abortion that happens there in Uganda, and we have a lot of need for women just to come and walk with our, our, uh, our African sisters and, and brothers who are struggling with this. Uh, this is a young lady who we met through that, who, uh, who was going to have an abortion. She chose to retain the baby uh, through our ministry here, and here, she, here she's about to be baptized. Um, and it's such a satisfying ministry to be able to hold those babies. Now here we are doing a deworming clinic. This is uh, right on the border of Rwanda and uh, Congo, it's still in Uganda. Uh, but it was, it was amazing for me. I was, I, they heard I was a doctor and I got utterly mobbed by people who had never seen a doctor before. Many of them had never seen a doctor before in their lives. Uh, a couple of them had, and I was trying to figure out what do you have and uh, trying to work through various conditions. Amazing, amazing amounts of need. We have a great biology program for those who want to go down the route of being, being uh, physicians. Uh, we had lots of baptisms uh, happen there. This is a young man who was baptized this past summer uh, when, when we were there. And we also ordained a deacon as well. Uh, he's a Muslim background individual who's now uh, leading the, uh, the congregation there. And of course, took a little bit of time out to have some fun, uh, went out and Saw animals like this and lots and lots of, of elephants there. So it was, uh, it was a great experience. So why Sattler? Again, in one word, it's discipleship. And I want to encourage you while you're here to spend especially time with students and faculty. Uh, again, we have Will Oliver here. I saw Jesse Schumann who was here a second ago. Oh, there he is. Um, Jonathan McClatchy, Zach Johnson, our president, Dean Taylor, anyone who is especially teaching, as well as our students. Um, our, our Sattler ultimately is the people, and we want you to join Jesus' peaceful revolution and lighting the world through relational discipleship and academic excellence. So I did that in 18 minutes, which is, I was told 20 minutes, so I hit my, my, uh, my time constraint there. Back to you. Right now, I'm going to invite the, the faculty panel on stage with me, and maybe you can just, if you're on the panel, you could just grab a chair right here, one of these benches, and join me on stage. I think President Taylor, you're also, I see your name on this panel, so you can, can help us here. All right, so we're just gonna move into a, a session on, basically an information session on academics. And first of all, I'm just gonna have each of you introduce yourselves, your position at Sattler, and some of the classes, or all the classes that you teach. We'll start with President Taylor and move our way down. Um, I teach uh, one of the humanities class, which focus on starting from the Antonicene period onto 
sort of late medieval, right, pre-Reformation, and teach that, and also historical theology too, which takes it from the Reformation time until early modern. So. Hi, Dr. Will Oliver. Uh, I teach all the business classes. Well, not all of them, but I teach a lot of them. It seems like I've taught one or, one or uh, each of them at least once. Um, and uh, I come to the school with a background having taught at several top universities. Uh, and uh, as well, I've been in business for about 40 years. So um, I love to bring the practical side as well as the theoretical side to business. My name's Dr. Jesse Schumann, and I don't teach anywhere near all of the biblical and religious <laughs> studies courses. Um, I do teach uh, the Hebrew sequence. Uh, I've taught uh, Judaism, and I regularly teach a course on Islam. I've done a book study on Isaiah, class on New Testament use of Old Testament, book study on Mark. I think so far, uh, that's at least most of the classes I've taught here. And I'm Jonathan McClatchy, and I uh, chair the biology program here at Sattler. Uh, so I teach uh, the freshman principles biology course, which is part of our core curriculum. So all of you who sign up to become students here uh, for the degree students will um, take uh, the biology 101 course. I also teach genetics and genomics, which um, and where we talk about inheritance, patterns of inheritance, that, that kind of thing. And, uh, genetic counseling, by the way, is one career trajectory that's often overlooked um, when it comes to what careers you can do with a bio degree. Um, I also teach uh, microbiology, uh, which is fascinating. It's been a lot in the news recently with uh, our SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, so we talk about viruses and bacteria and um, parasites and that kind of thing. And I also teach an elective course in uh, bioethics. Um, so. Uh, which deals with ethical decisions uh, relating to the practice of medicine and science, such as um, uh, confidenti patient confidentiality, abortion, assisted suicide, even vaccine ethics, and that kind of thing. Great. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to kick it off with the first question. I have a list of questions, and then I'll open it back up to the audience. If you're a current student and you think there's a question that should be asked, make sure to ask it too. But in when interacting with future students, I often warn warn students that Sattler is an academically rigorous institution. Agreed or disagreed? Probably agreed. Okay, I th I'm trying to just get head nods. Yeah. So can you, can, I, I, was, I was hoping to get some head nods there from our, our faculty here. Can you explain sort of your teaching style and what you expect from your students in your classroom? And we can maybe we can start with Jonathan and, and make our way back down here. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, sorry, you said teaching style. Teaching style and what you expect from your students. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I I like to um, in, uh, engage in a flipped classroom model of teaching, especially with um, my genetics class, which is my sophomore class. So um, one. Uh, so I ask the students to read uh, the chapter um, ahead of ahead of time. And then uh, they show up to class and they work in pairs or groups to solve problems. Um, and then we go over those problems together in class. And so that helps to reinforce what they've read. Uh, with the freshman class, I also have the students read the textbook ahead of time. Um, I um, have them take a, a, a quiz ahead of the class period. And then they come to class already being prepared with the material. And then we discuss uh, the material, which helps to consolidate what they've already hopefully learned at home. Um, and then that, I think, prepares them well for doing the, the midterms and the final exams, uh, uh, which are uh, the more weighty uh, assessments in the course. So. Mm -hmm. I would say it, uh, it depends a little bit based on what class I take uh, or what class I teach. Uh, I'll talk about Hebrew because of those of you who come in as four-year BA students, you'll take the Hebrew class. You may not take other classes that I teach. Um, but one of my uh, guiding principles for Hebrew is I do want to inspire as many people as I possibly can uh, to become, like myself, a lifelong reader of uh, Greek and Hebrew. I don't teach Greek, but I love to read Greek. And one of my thoughts with human nature is you don't keep doing something unless you both enjoy it and you're good at it. Um, and so 
I try to design class periods that uh, Hebrew class is surprisingly enjoyable. Um, but then to work towards a reading fluency um, that students can, uh, can read with surprising ease the, the biblical text. And with it, uh, I realize the only reason why, or typically the only reason why someone would want to learn Hebrew is to be able to uh, go deeper into the Old Testament. And so all throughout, um, we're reading simplified biblical texts uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to understand these stories more deeply. I'll give just a little bit of a teaser. One of the stories that we're going to be doing next semester in Hebrew class is David and Abigail. And you know the story of uh, David's beef, beef with Nabal. And because Nabal has stood David up and, and won't show him hospitality, David's going to come against him and wipe out um, his whole clan. But then Abigail comes in with the bread and the wine and appeases David. Um, but what I don't think really anybody knows about the story of David and Abigail is actually how it begins and how it ends. It begins with Samuel, the prophet Samuel dying. That's verse one of the chapter. The final verse of the chapter is King Saul takes his daughter Michael, who he's already given to David as a wife, takes her and then gives her to another man. It's really strange. Like, how would you tell a story? You bookend it with Samuel's death and then King Saul taking his daughter away from David and giving her to another man. And in the middle, that's actually how we're supposed to understand the meaning of this story with David and Abigail. How do you, how do you fit those pieces together? I'm not going to give you the answer, um, but part of how I teach Hebrews is to try to inspire learning, that uh, to, to give you a question that you're interested in, in answering, to give a problem that uh, you have a, a, an inner fire to try to, like, I want to know the answer to this question um, and to solve this problem because if you go through the work of, of going through the problem solving, of answering a question that you found interesting, that's knowledge that's more likely to stick. And so that's, I think, just a little bit of a, a, of a taste of how I think of if, if I can do a, a good um, aspiring to do an excellent job teaching, this is how I want to go about doing it. And you do a good job at it. That's amazing. <laughs> so again, Dr. Oliver, I teach business. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, focus around three words. Uh, Non-siloed, yeah, I know that's not one word. Um, active and hard. Um, one of the things that I've experienced, and I've taught at a number of universities around the Boston area, and I even taught at UC Irvine out in California, is most universities are very siloed. Uh, it's not like that here. So if I want to know, you know, what does the Hebrew really mean? You know, I just pop over to Jer uh, Jesse's office. If I'm struggling with some question about how to teach a statistical concept, I pop over to Derek Tate or Zach or you know one of the other guys that know that stuff, and and there's a lot of sort of working together, which is unusual in higher education. And, um, and uh, it, it not only makes it more fun for me, I'm sure it makes it more fun for the students and, and a better learning opportunity. Um, the other word is, act, or the next word is active. And uh, a guy named John Seeley Brown has been kind of ripping up the educational world with a concept. Um, very simply put, adults don't learn from PowerPoints. They don't learn from one-way flow of information. Uh, they learn by first experiencing something, learning they can't do it by themselves, but they want to, so they get hungry and try to, try to you know, go ahead and learn it. And, and I think John, Lee, John Seeley Brown is actually dead wrong. Um, <laughs> I look at the kids over here, you think that's not how kids learn? You, you, kids, you, you tell a kid, no, that's hot, don't touch, oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so all of my education is action-based. Uh, so for example, um, uh, next term I'll be teaching my marketing course and the last time we taught the marketing course uh, yeah we had a textbook yeah we had some quizzes but the backbone of the course was uh, working together with a um, coffee collaborative in Nicaragua a, a Christian coffee collaborative uh, to develop them a whole new marketing strategy 
and up to now they've been selling coffee for uh, on average a dollar a pound through big consortiums that would sell into Starbucks and places like that. And, and we helped them, we worked closely with the leadership of that organization and helped them understand that there's a, there's a whole new wave in coffee called uh, Third Wave. And it's, it's selling the farmers, selling a relationship, selling the pictures, selling, you know, I can trace these beans right back to the farm where it was grown. And, and that kind of coffee is worth $4 a pound. And we really helped them look at their website, look at their marketing, identify 100 new uh, brokers that they could sell coffee to, all as part of this class. All right? and, and it was an amazing, amazing opportunity to learn marketing for real. Uh, another quick example, uh, yesterday I sat in on a presentation where uh, a group of students were learning this new data analytics tool called Power BI. And uh, they had gotten together with a group in New Hampshire that provides uh, ski coaching to um, quadriplegics, uh, you know, various kinds of disabled folks. And uh, data entered the, the uh, coaching sheets, took them 10 hours to data enter a bunch of sheets, and then put together a really cool uh, presentation showing some remarkable things about uh, the, the, the leadership of this organization didn't know about about their students. So once again, you know, it's, it's action learning. You, you get a chance to do something that really matters, and then you're willing to go back and learn. The third word is hard, and I see some of my students out in the, out in the audience. Um, no, cl close your ears. <laughs> um, the course I teach in data analytics is one I just mentioned. Um, I have taken, I've repurposed a course I taught at the graduate level at U UMass Amherst, which is a top-ranked school. I've ratcheted it up about 30 to 50 percent from the graduate course, and that's what I expect of my undergraduates. Um, my undergraduates, I would compare favorably to, mo to lots of graduate students. Uh, and it's because I think I make it exciting, you know, action-based action, uh, uh, education. But I think it's because they have just super capabilities, and, and everybody comes. Everybody that comes here wants to learn. It's so much, so much fun to teach. So, what were the words? Non-siloed, action, and hard. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Um, the question that I frequently ask, uh, or I, the statement that I frequently say in my class, is that if an argument has lasted longer than 500 years. It's not stupid. <laughs> and so the passion that I have is that, that all of our students will understand the conversations that have happened through the history of our church, to understand the theological um, things that we've gone through. And, and one of the things I try to do also by saying that statement, that an argument that lasts longer than 500 years is not stupid, is to sometimes get on the other side of it. For instance, just uh, was it yesterday? Uh, day for yesterday, and during the class, we were getting to the point of the Spanish Inquisition and the persecution of the different uh, Christians done by them. But then I tried to flip it and ask the question, is there something inside of us that would do this kind of evil thing to someone else? And instead of always just seeing ourselves as the Waldensians and, you know, and, and the evil Catholics are against us, is there something like that that makes us that is, can we reflect upon that and see some things within us? And so I believe that by understanding these conversations, by understanding the, the theological points of, of what the church has gone through the centuries, very much increases our ability to read our scripture properly. That we do believe that we have an ancient faith that was handed to us and that we should contend for that. And so the idea of that, those classes, both historical theology one and two, is to really be part of that conversation and to continue it in your generation. Yeah, thank you for that. And then I'm gonna open it to the audience and affirm, at least Dr. Schumann, we have gotten noise complaints from Hebrew class a couple times. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But the Old Testament is not silent, right? So that, that's a good thing. So are there any, any questions in the audience that, um, that, that came up that we can, we can address here? Just raise your hand and, and ask your question. I have a question for Dr. Schumann. I, I, I don't know if there's another time he's going to share this, but the, the way that you teach the language languages is significantly different. I don't know just about the whole action-oriented, communicative approach and that kind of a thing. It's just a few words on. Yeah, yeah um, well, 
y- unique and and not unique. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no. There there are many people who teach language this way, even Hebrew and Greek this way at other schools. And so um, we're not just reinventing the wheel, but we are building, I hope, on those who have come before us. So with how both Greek and Hebrew is taught, so uh, day one, we're beginning with a method called total physical response. And it was actually um, discovered and developed by a trained uh, psychologist. Um, And what he, and he kind of stumbled upon it by accident as he was learning a language, someone was giving him some commands to do simple tasks. And, And he realized that those words, those commands, they stuck with him. And so there's this uh, kinesthetic aspect to it of involving all of the senses of Im- embodying it. It's, n- it's not something that's just, you know, really abstract if we're just going between one language and another, but actually like with this language, we're accomplishing tasks, we're doing things, we're having communication. Um, and really it models how we learn our first language. Um, a lot of uh, the initial uh, language input for a child um, is by way of commands, of of don't do that, of come here, of pointing and saying what something is. And so really early on, I mean, it begins super, super simply, just telling someone in the language to stand up, sit down. All these, uh, so that's why it's called total physical response. If you give a command and then somebody involves their whole body to do that thing, um, of walk here, touch this. And, and you know as a teacher and as a student if there's, uh, like I know if you don't understand what I'm saying because you're not doing what I, I told you to do. And so it starts out really simply, but then it develops, I mean, it develops into a a storytelling. And so, um, you know, uh, standing up and sitting down is only exciting for so long. Um, But what never ceases to capture our imagination is a good story. Um, And so uh, after about six weeks, then that's where I get into um, simplified uh, Old Testament stories. What's fantastic, what I get to do with, uh, with the Old Testament Hebrew, is that we already have uh, tons of amazing stories um, that are already there, that are true, and that encourage our faith. Um, and so, so that's what um, I, it's a, I guess, a little bit more of a taste of what I do with Hebrew, and then uh, Professor Andrew Lamasella does the equivalent thing with Greek. What he, what he means is he plays with puppets. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why the floor underneath us complained because of all the racket from his from his classes. I will I will say actually that wasn't my Hebrew class. That was the ping pong. Uh, there's that the, was the, the ping there's pong game there's on. debate about this. <laughs> Active debate about this. <laughs> All right, any, any questions from the audience? I know, right here. So I, the first question is, is it possible to fail a class? Oh, the percentage of students that fail classes, and is it possible to double major? Does anyone have any uh, the right data for those two questions? Know that yet? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Um, as far as how many people fail, uh, well, I guess there would be you know percentage of Sattler classes that have been failed, or the percentage of students that have failed a class. Um, and I don't know, it, it's definitely less than 10% of students that have failed the class, I would assume, um, and probably less than 5% of all Sattler classes that um, have been failed. I, of, of all of my classes, 
I have not had any students fail my class. Um, as, and then the second uh, double major, I don't think we've had no. anybody double major. Yeah. Um, in I And I wouldn't recommend it um, because at the end of the day, you're still just getting one degree. Um, and so, so you have a degree or you don't. Um, and that's really uh, the most important distinguishing factor. Um, I, I, I would almost, yeah, I don't know if I would ever recommend double major. If, if I would, I mean, boy, wow, that would, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to start with the failure question first, too. Um, uh, I, I haven't had any student fail a business course. In fact, I've got a student this year who might get a B, and I'm, I'm just crustfallen because to me, it's not about the student failing. It's about, you know, our classes are so small mm -hmm. that if, if a student's not doing well, it's my job to intervene and make sure that we fix that problem. Uh, and so it's my job as a student to make sure that students don't fail. And if, and if somebody gets a B, then I've failed. And I, I, it's kind of a different way to look at it. Um, with regard to a double major, um, I, I think a better way to look at it is a minor. So um, you, know, you, you could come and have a business major and a BRS minor, or a BRS major and a business minor. And that kind of reflects to the world better that, um, you know, that this, is, this is kind of, kind of my, my primary focus and my secondary focus. Uh, besides, you have to have too many courses to get a business major. There's no, room, there's no time to get other th things. It's just such a rich program here. Thanks for your questions. Any other questions from the audience? All right, so you, now you know who to ask around if you have a question and you didn't want to ask it personally. So I'm going to, I'm going to move on to the next activity. Maybe, gentlemen, could you just pull your chairs off here? All right, I just want to introduce the audience to each other. So maybe everyone can just stand up together. Yeah, everyone, everyone stand up together here, yeah. And I'm, I'm just gonna ask everybody, ask visitors, no, no, let's do this. Everyone in the audience, just say your name and why you're here. <laughs> if you're a student, maybe say your major and then maybe where you came from. And we'll start right here with, with Jonathan here. I'm Austin Ressler. Um, I am a biology major, and I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. My name is Jack, and I'm here possibly checking out coming here next year, and I'm from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. My name is Josh, and I'm Jack's dad. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Matthew Glick. I'm here from Lancaster, Pennsylvania with a group of a uh, couple other friends out of the area. Hey, I'm Emily Nisley. I'm from Central Kansas. I'm a sophomore here, and I'm a business major. I affirm everything Dr. Oliver said. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Joshua Hofer. I grew up in Minnesota. I currently live here in Malden. I'm a prospective student. I'm Roseanne Glick. I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and we're here to visit. Came with my brother. I'm Benio Glick, her husband. I'm Ivan Fisher. I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm, I, I'm interested in possibly pursuing a biology degree. I'm Christian. I'm here possibly doing a biology degree, degree too. My name is Morgan Gobley. I'm from Minnesota, and I'm a friend of Ralph. <laughs> and I'm Ralph. <laughs> 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 I'm Chloe Milioni and just family of a student here. So I wanted to hear more about what Sattler does. I'm Elisha Milioni and I'm a brother of one of the students here. Just come and check it out. I'm Matthew Kaufman. I'm working in the finances accounting here at Sattler. And this is my wife, Melissa. I'm Kimberly Kurtz. I live here, and I am the Director of Admissions and Marketing here at Sattler. 
I'm Shirley Zhang, and uh, I came from Massachusetts. I'm a parent of uh, homeschoolers, and uh, we're exciting to check out this uh, college. Okay. Uh, I'm Elijah Milioni. I live here in Boston, and I'm a prospective student. All right. Yeah, let's get the let's get the lurkers in the corner to introduce themselves too. <laughs> Um, I'm Clayton Wagler from Southern Indiana. I am a uh, second year biblical and religious studies major. I am Dylan Martin, a business major, and I'm from Pennsylvania. My name is Joshua Stolzfus. I'm from Pennsylvania, and I am part of the one year biblical and religious studies um, certificate program. My name is Jonathan Stolzfus. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm a freshman history major. My name is Jess Horner. I'm from Virginia, and I'm a sophomore, and my major is Biblical and Religious Studies. Hey, everyone. I'm Michael. I'm a senior here at Sattler. I'm a biology major. I was born and raised in Cairo, Egypt. Hi, I'm Jacob Weeb. I'm from Leamington, Ontario, Canada. Uh, I'm a freshman studying biology. All right, we'll 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 stop there. <laughs> so I know we don't have to go all around the room here. And so it's 11:04. We're gonna restart in six minutes. So take a quick break. Go grab some water. Use the restroom if you have to. And we'll we'll come back with a presentation from President Taylor and then a, a student panel. All right. See you in in six minutes.
one minute. Find your seats. All right, welcome everybody, and welcome our new ones here that are coming in today. Um, so the, the thing that I'm going to talk about is just there's many things that I think make um, Sattler College unique, um, but I'm going to just hone in on, on two of those. And I, the two words that I, that I think I'm going to bring up is the word kingdom and the word vocation. And I think that both of these are, are just important for, our, for your generation. So, kingdom. I, I believe that more than ever, I believe that there is a growing awareness that our world, our country, our city, our, our churches in many times, are broken. This realization is no longer coming just from the church and this cry of brokenness, but now we see that even the secular world is crying out that something must be done. I think Brother Finney touched on some of that. We've seen violent unrest coming from both political left and the right, and the right, and we believe that they are looking for answers, and they're finding them oftentimes in, in many of the wrong places. As the world is grasping for these answers, we at Sattler College firmly and unapologetically believe that Jesus Christ and his kingdom and his way is the cure for humanity, without apology and without reservation. So the, if you think about just, just since I've been here in Boston, how the world has, has changed and the different things that are happening, again, in, in the generations that, that, that you're inheriting. I, I've read that uh, uh, Brother Finney just showed a statistic of those who go to church, and even the dynamics of people living in urban settings and not urban settings and seeing the, the mass movement of people coming more into bigger, bigger cities um, is realizing that the way that we respond to people and the way that we are ministering to them and reaching them are needing to change. I heard a statistic just yesterday at one of our guest speakers that says that most of the population lives, of, they were saying over 80%. The statistic that I had here was at least 66%. Um, are living in urban settings. How is the church to respond to these things? Another thing that, is, that has amazed me just in the, in the very few years that I've been, been even here in Boston is the hands of power going more and more to social media and things like this. This is getting actually odd. I, I, we, I've seen just recently the, the things in the news about you know, very polarized forms of social media. I was just talking to Dr. McClatchy here before, who's starting a, a, a new website uh, that he put on Facebook of helping people deal with doubts about Christianity, which it appears has now been blocked in several times in his in Facebook account. And so when we're seeing this kind of thing happening, what is the response of the church? This polarization, this political, spiritual polarization is, is scary. Another thing that I've seen just in my lifetime, just in the last few years, is this phenomena of refugee and misplaced people in this world. When I, four or five years ago, when I started getting into the refugee ministry in Lesbos Island and, and dealing with that, I looked into the UNHCR and it said there that there was 64 million people that were displaced. Well, just recently, after this recent Afghanistan things that's been happening. I said, oh, I wonder what the numbers are these days. And I went and looked today, or a few weeks ago, 82 million. 
just in this last four years that, and I know we get sort of uh, number fatigue. Do you realize that that population is more than Canada, Ireland, Congo, El Salvador, Israel, Switzerland, and Australia put together? Put together. That kind of population displaced. And I believe that this is something in your generation that's going to make a difference. I believe every generation has something that happens. In my generation, one of the most significant things that occurred was the falling of the Berlin Wall. My wife and I had the, the, the incredible opportunity to be there at the wall when it was coming down in 1989. In your generation, I do believe the Arab Spring of 2011 and what it's formed with the displaced people in, during these times is giving both crisis and remarkable opportunities. We are literally seeing the birth of cities that are occurring right now as we speak. And those cities need vocations, jobs, doctors, churches, business people um, to get into those and make a difference. So we invite you here to Boston to take four years of your life and study Jesus Christ, his word in the original language, his church throughout history. We invite you to learn and defend your faith in apologetic classes, evangelism, and discipleship. Have Brother Finney's class, and he takes you out on, on, on uh, evangelism. It's very challenging. And those, discipleship, and, and those discipleship groups that we have to learn habits of purity. You know, we've been throwing stones and many times at this group or that group about their failure in purity. We can throw stones no longer. It affects every single one of us. And we're not hearing answers. As I get with different church leaders and different things, it's like, yeah, it's hard. But what are we doing about it? Our young people, we're losing to pornography every day. And we want to take a stand and make a difference there. We want you to understand the church and your generation within church history. Not for the sake of history. In our day, when all the false doctrines and bizarre interpretation of scriptures are broadcasted from every laptop and cell phone, we think it's time that you better get grounded in the faith. And the other word is vocation. And I purposely didn't use the word careers, but vocation. And here's why. Discovering, I believe that discovering your calling, your life vocation, is one of the most important things that a young person can do. You know, many people waste, sadly, years of their life in unproductive, unproductive jobs, dead ends, mistakes, and you often leave that, those places dissatisfied, frustrated, frustrated, burnout, or worst, cynical. They say you're as young as your dream and old as your cynicism. Watch out for cynicism. It is our desire that for you to get in touch with God's calling in your life, to explore vocations that will not only give you a career, yes, pay the bills, but that will make you answer the question, yeah, that's why I'm alive. That's why I'm alive. It makes you tick. It makes you go. So we have different vocations, and we try to bring those into a kingdom way that gives purpose and meaning for an entire life of calling. We have pre-med. Um, in just four years of our existence, I'm already thrilled to see exciting callings that students are discovering in their, their vocation. I've seen for, I have, I'm, a, I'm a dad. I have four of my children going here, and hearing them work through their life and different callings and different things is impressive. Um, I, I mentioned, I talked to a, a pre-med student. I didn't ask her for permission, but during the summer, she was over in, I think it was Pakistan, and as she was over there, she was able to look at some of these, these different cases and the children and the mortality rate of all these children, and I asked her after she gave her presentation here, I said, did you get that moment, that yeah, that's why I exist moment. And she said, yeah, I did. That's what we want. Business majors looking at how can we, how can we bring in, you know, nowadays would you, when I was in my looking over in Europe and the different mission opportunity, the walls of, of visas are going up. Well, they're going down for business. And so being able to have kingdom-focused businesses and ways to get in there and to, and to have ways to get into different places is amazing. And here in our own country, as we see our country spiraling into decay, what are we going to do that makes a difference here? Computer science majors. I, I, just the other day, I was talking with a group down in Lancaster County who does 
who does computer programming in Chazikistan, bringing out conversions of Muslim people and starting successful businesses. He wants to go more and more. He wants to, to talk with us about seeing ways to get into different closed countries to bring the gospel there. Here in this country also, to have a decent job and, and, a, and a way to have a way that you can put some time into the kingdom, into your family, and that type of a thing. History. I think a history, um, I'm a history geek, so I think that our history uh, major is amazing, and it's excellent for teachers because it really shows you the skills of research, teaching, um, and getting and, and writing and those type of a thing. And I think that many people who are interested in a teaching career, our history major is perfect for that. And then last but not least, our most popular, a biblical and religious studies, which we have two tracks, one that goes further into the uh, expository writing and studying the Greek and Hebrew at a higher level. The other one that takes a look at more in ministry opportunities and counseling. We have a lot of our, our young ladies have had a, a, a passion about human trafficking and getting involved with some of those things. And I've been very impressed with seeing those different tracks use, get, bringing out those different um, callings. So that's those two things that we have. I'm going to give you a, a statement this last summer, and then I'm, uh, I'm going to show you a video. This last summer, um, meeting with Brother Finney and several of the people here, I, we were trying to say, okay, why do we exist? What makes us tick? What makes all of us move and, and take these, these chances and be here? And this was the statement, and then I'm going to show you the video, why we exist. United with Jesus and rooted in Scripture, with the discipline and sacrifice of soldiers of Jesus Christ to put God's word into action, propagate the historic Christian faith and partner with churches and partner with churches to establish faithful communities that bring the kingdom of God to the world's cities, conflicts, and corners of the earth while educating, discipling, inspiring, and mobilizing graduates to do the same. So we just have this brand new, you're the first audience that we've given it to. Um, we have, we're we're going to have a little video, and then I'm going to hand it back over to Zach at the end of this and take it from there. So, which is our brand new video of About Sattler. You know, here in Boston, the last figure that I read was there's 155,000 students here. You know, here in Boston, the last figure that I read was there's 155,000 students here in Boston. Why do they need another college? Sattler was founded to promote the historic Christian faith. So what does that mean? It means, as Jude describes, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The community at Sattler is more like an intentional family. It just feels like everyone goes out of their way to draw people in, to really make sure that everyone is succeeding and is included um, and feels loved and accepted no matter if they you know, came from down the street or if they came from Kansas. What makes Sattler difference in particular are the teachings of Jesus. I mean, this is the way we think about it. What if Jesus really meant every word he said? And if we take the teachings of Jesus, we take the New Testament and put those things into a practical application then and build an education system around that, then we believe that's very different than your colleges in this world. The family thread of Sattler is that Christ and his mission is integral to all of our lives. And we just don't want to be a people that are still, that accept some of the problems around us. And you see a lot of people here just spend hours and hours and hours preparing to take on some of the problems that they care about and also pour into relationships. So just to reiterate, like a, an intentional family who doesn't like stillness. People are never content with where they're at spiritually here. That's something yes. I've seen. Like, yeah. yeah, and it's hard to be complacent and content when you're surrounded by fantastic preachers and evangelists and scientists and writers. Especially seeing those people, those great preachers, those great, um, those great scientists pushing themselves farther. They're like, oh, yeah. I don't know. I I get 
fired up about it. The thing we're most excited about right now is that Sattler is now a nationally accredited institution. When I came here, when Sattler began, that was the goal. Before our first class graduates, let's be accredited so that those students who want to go to graduate school, who want to become doctors, that they will have no problem getting into the graduate schools that they want to go to. And everybody here pulled together and worked very hard to make sure that happened. And now by, by the grace of God, by the blessing of God, it has been achieved and we can say that we are an accredited institution. Sattler is a very academically challenging place, but it is so rewarding. I would recommend it to people who want to grow in their relationship with God and become better at relating to other people, working with other people, becoming a better person in general. So if you're interested in growing in a holistic way, Sattler is a great place to prepare for that and to even just learn to think through those things. If you are a person who is willing to learn, who enjoys hard work, then if you have that dedication, you would fit in perfectly here. I'm a sophomore and a biology major, and I'm also vice president of student life. So I'm gonna give a little overview of what student life is like at Sattler, what our mission is, what our goals are. And then after that, we're gonna have a student panel come up to answer some questions about what student culture is like amongst the students and, um, and in our community. So first, what is student life? Student life is the culture and the community that is fostered by the students here. And for me personally, I've been, I've seen the most transformation in myself in um, just seeing like the relationships I'm building with people here, with peers that have a similar drive and a desire to see the kingdom come. And that has been the most impactful part of Sattler that has been supported by the academics and classes. Um, Sattler student life involves student events that connect us, involves volunteering, clubs, the discipleship program that Dr. Cravilla talked about, and a corporate worship. And all of these things um, are instituted to, to inspire us and inflame our hearts with a desire for the kingdom and desire for Christ. Um, and it, it's been so exciting being with peers that care about those things too and that can encourage me and and push me forward in that. So um, as a member of the student council, we have a lot of conversations about how we can maintain a culture among our students that supports um, these biblical principles, these values, and, and that maintains an encouraging community. So we developed four pillars of the student culture to, to ground us into to push us forward into these, um, into our goals, into our, into our hopes there. So the first, of the, this first pillar is awe animates us. Um, and we wrote that the Sattler community life flows from a deep reverence for God, awe for his word and works, fuels the fire of everything we pursue. And we try to incorporate that with um, weekly prayer meetings and weekly scripture readings together and even in our tea time, just trying to incorporate this, this constant reverence and, and praise to God um, in the midst of a busy college, a college life. Um, second is honesty humbles us. The Sattler community grows by honesty. Honesty means humbly recognizing both strengths and weaknesses in our individual lives. And I'm so thankful for the um, systems of accountability that we have at Sattler to help us be honest with ourselves and to grow humbly in our relationships, um, in our relationship with Jesus. 
A third is love lifts us. Um, Sattler community chooses sacrifice before self. Sacrificial loves mean sacrificial love means love lifting each other's at the expense of our own success. And I've been encouraged in how I've seen this sacrificial love in our faculty and in our RAs, people who sacrifice their own interests for um, our benefit. And um, we we try to cultivate this sacrificial love in building intentional relationships with each other um, and having a uplifting dorm life and having these student events that keep us connected as a student body. And then fourth, service shapes us. The Sattler community embodies the way of Jesus by serving and proclaiming the gospel. Service means actively reaching the world around us. And it's especially easier now since COVID's done, or slowing down a little bit. Um, and we've been able to engage more with the community around us, either teaching English at the bridge, which some students have taken advantage of. That's a English uh, learning center for immigrants and whoever wants to come. And there's been volunteering in East Boston, um, several opportunities that have come up in, especially this semester that we're very excited to take advantage of. So there's a lot of facets of student life that um, are pushing, that I found to push me closer to to Jesus and my desire to see his kingdom come. Um, but yeah, I want to invite the other students that are going to be on this panel, and we want to answer some questions that you have about Sattler culture, student life here. Um, yeah, Dylan. So, as you guys are getting situated, no, no I'm not going to sit down. I'm going to stand. As you guys are getting situated, um, first go through and say your name once more and then give me one word that would describe your experience here at Sattler as a student. Hi, my name is Seth. I'm a junior, a biblical religious studies major. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, and one word that would describe my experience as a student, um, I would say clarifying. Hi, my name is Carrie Yoder. I'm a sophomore and biology student. And are we saying where we're from? Sure. I'm from Goshen, Indiana. Um, one word to describe my Sattler experience, um, difficult and good. Can I have two? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily Nisley. I'm from Central Kansas. I'm a sophomore business major. And Sattler in one word, um, I think this is what it should be, and I think this is what it mostly is for me, and that's God. I'm going to use two words. One of them is an adjective. All out because you're a senior. Uh, my name is Michael. I was uh, born and raised in e Cairo, Egypt. I am a senior biology major here at Sattler. And um, Sattler for me has been surprisingly transformational. Okay, now go back through and explain um, one way that you've seen or how you have came to that conclusion of just of your experience here. And then I'll open it up to audience questions. So start thinking about it. Uh, should I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, the reason I say that it was surprisingly, surprisingly transformational for me because um, God used my time here in a ways I would have not expected to really change who I am and what my life is about. Um, so I, I came into the school with certain expectations of where I would benefit from, and God would again and again surprise me with benefiting and reaping fruit from places I would not expect. But it was all here and through what Sattler is about that God sort of broadened me and gave me the benefit that I've been receiving from places I did not expect. So um, surprisingly transformational. Mm -hmm. I think this is kind of along with what you said, but I came here and I'm studying business, which doesn't seem like a super spiritual thing necessarily, but I've just found myself 
surprised at every turn of how everything comes back to God. And here at Sattler, there's a lot of fun things, there's a lot of hard things, um, there's a lot of growing things, but they all come back to God. And that just surprises me again and again um, and challenges me in really good ways. So my one word was difficult and good. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, Zach. <laughs> uh, yeah, and some of that is academically. So the biology major isn't a breeze, but a lot of the the really difficult and good parts of it has been in in learning about the church and the church in his in history and seeing how I fit into that and when looking at the cloud of witnesses before me, that's where do I fit there? Where do I fit in history and in the body of Christ? Um, and that's been humbling and hard, but, but really good. So Sattler has been <coughs> clarifying for me in, in a lot of ways. I think I'll, I'll just talk about one particularly significant way. Um, ever since I was really little, I wanted to be a, an overseas missionary. Um, I didn't know exactly where, and whenever someone would ask me, oh, like, like, what country are you thinking of? I was just like, I don't know. Uh, English is the, is the only um, language that I'm fluent in as, as to date. But um, throughout my time here at Sattler, and especially through a summer internship that I took to Uganda this, this past summer, um, I feel like my vision for life has been really clarified. And in this latter half of my college career, it's been really helpful to have something more definitive that I'm working towards. I'll open it up for audience questions. What would you ask, what would you like to ask a student here at Sattler? Yes. <laughs> so I, I would say probably there, there are two major lines of, of support. And um, there are also more official uh, ways to get help that the college has in place. But I think for most people, what's helpful is, first of all, um, their interactions with their peers. Um, it, is, it is an adjustment for most people. It is very difficult. Um, but it's not something that you're going through alone. You have a, a group of people who can, can sympathize with you and different strengths and weaknesses in that group. And I think the, the cohort model that Sattler offers where for the first couple of years you, you share many of the same classes um, really helps to, to build a, a bond um, between classes so that you have that support system. The other way is professors. The, the professor to student ratio here at Sattler is wild. I don't know exactly what it is, but um, as far as colleges go, um, you have a very high uh, professor to student ratio. Um, and so that gives professors uh, more time to um, help you out if, if you're struggling with something. and. And all the professors I've worked with genuinely like want to, to help, and they want you to um, enjoy their classes and, and get the most out of it um, that you can. So those would be the two things I would say. Okay, one, of one of our professors, I'm sure you met him earlier, I, I think he was on the panel, Dr. Schumann. He says that he's, he's your, uh, I think, coach, cheerleader, and accountability partner. No professor here will give you an amount of work that they're not themselves willing and ready to help you achieve. So even though the workload is large and they're, they're, they're it's stretching and broadening and all the other dimensions that you can think of, but the professors are willing and wanting and their, their trajectory is, if I'm gonna give you this amount of work, I am in a place and a position and a willing disposition to help you get through it. And that's been my experience with every single professor that I have reached out to. And um, I know Dr. Schumann has sort of landmarks for, for the students where if he sees that it's necessary to reach out to a student himself, he will. So, um, and this is what 
kind of along what Seth was saying, I went to a year um, in, in George Mason. It's a school in Virginia, just a state college. And the, you, th the professors are just some you know, small figure down at the end of a big lecture hall, and you don't see them except you know, however many times a week, when or if you go to lecture. Here, if you miss a class, you'll get an email. Is everything okay? Like, are things going well? And um, not like, you know, you're in trouble kind of email, but the, the professors here are on your side. and their families so that's like yeah you just you feel like there's a, a really um, you get to know them just something that you can't say for a lot of college professors any other audience questions yes Ralph So my, uh, I'm a biology major, um, which there are two ways you can go, actually three ways you can take a bio major. You can go into medical school, which is a long process that requires graduate school, or you can do go into research, um, or you can go into teaching. My The summer of my freshman year, I had uh, an internship at a biotherapeutics company here in Boston called Magenta, which is not something that happens to a freshman biology major. I have nothing under my belt. I'm just a kid who went to college for a year. and um, But Sattler, because of its location and because of our faculty who have um, very powerful connections in each of their fields, I was able to get an internship there my first summer. Uh, actually, that internship, I made connections there. In the world of biology, once you step in, you need to make connections, and it goes from there. I have uh, another internship lined up this next semester, and that'll be my capstone project with a contact that I made there. And that internship is looking like it will potentially be um, a work opportunity afterwards. So, and that's just one small example. I'm, I'm one of many people who, who have um, the doors that already are open to them and they are already, in a way, stepping into their future even while they're still here at Sattler. I'm gonna take a go at this. So, where I want to end up is somewhere in missions and using my biology degree to benefit um, Christians and churches um, where they don't have those, those same resources. And um, what I'm doing about that right now, it's a little hard to, uh, how do I engage with the church, you know, the international church here in Boston when I'm doing school? But there's a group of students who's um, thinking of taking Arabic classes next semester just on their own, and that they'll meet together and pray, and they'll do evangelism in, um, in communities with um, immigrants here in Boston. And so just engaging with those groups of students who are pushing into, um, pushing into their calling now and, and being uh, faithful in, in the Galilee <laughs> where we are, and really building those, building relationships, evangelizing, making connections where we are here in college. And um, I think that's a way that, uh, especially the more, the people that are planning on doing missions after school, how we're, we're staying connected and doing things now for our, for our long-term goal. I've had the privilege of joining with a few other students this semester um, in some, some evening work at The Bridge, which was mentioned earlier. It's the English Training Center in Malden, um, just a little bit north of here. And uh, we've been preparing oral Bible stories uh, based on the, the parables and stories from the life of Jesus. Um, and we share them with um, anyone who, who will come. It's a free program. Most of them are immigrants. Um, and they're coming there to practice their, their English communication skills. But while they're doing that, they um, have the opportunity to hear these Bible stories over and over again um, and memorize them, retell them. And um, we've, we've already seen at least a couple of individuals this semester who have been really seriously 
um, working through the teachings of Jesus with the hopes of entering um, the, the church as a result of that. Uh, yes, we'll make it really quick. Go ahead. We have time for one question and one answer. Go ahead. If you're wondering, like, on the student side, I mean, you're here, and there's a lot of, like, um, strong people on the payroll and the church level and whatnot. Do you feel like you have the opportunity or the time to expand, you know, all the nine sphere's um, in that context? Do you feel like, and I'm aware, okay, no, sorry, President Taylor, it's okay. Do you feel like you feel like So I, I come from a very, very different background. Um, I was born and raised in the Orthodox Church, even even though that's a very broad range of what the Orthodox Church is. Um, I will tell you this. There has not been a time that I had a concern or a question or an idea even that was just not heard. Even if it, even if at times it might seem like it's rubbing against the grain of the college's vision. What Sattler is good at is that they have a vision and they have a purpose and they're willing to sacrifice to hold on to it. If I bring something up that aligns with the vision, of course I'll take it. If it does not align the vision, and their vision is a good vision, because I in, in the circumstances the world is in right now, a college like this does not exist. This is, this is a fairy tale. When I first, true story, when I first found this college, I, I was joking with myself that this is a trap they made to, to kidnap serious Christians. What do you mean a school in the middle of Boston, this dedicated? Um, for the school to remain that way, they need to hold on to certain precepts. And um, I think it's good for them to do that. But they are open and they are, uh, they are willing to hear and they are very, like I mentioned earlier, the faculty here is on your side. It's, it's all for the same purpose and it's all for the same kingdom. Um, if you have things to share, they will listen. But if 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 it furthers the vision, yes. If it goes against the vision, the the vision is the kingdom, and and that's what we're after. So, yeah. Thanks for the question. That's all the time we have. Um, I'll turn it over to Kimberly Kurtz for admissions and financial aid. Thank you all. So good morning. So I'm Kimberly. Um, I work in admissions and marketing here. And yeah, I'm super excited that all of you are here and glad to see you. Um, apparently this needs to turn around. Do, 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 do. All right, so I'm just going to give a really quick overview of um, admissions and financial aid. Um, so there's two reasons that it'll be kind of quick. These processes are generally pretty individual. Um, and in addition to being pretty individual, after lunch, there's going to be kind of two opportunities. One opportunity to just ask admissions questions, to ask admissions and financial aid questions specifically, um, because generally those some of those questions tend to not be super broad. Um, and then there'll kind of be an opportunity if you are thinking about starting an application to walk through the entire application process with me so that you can finish it while you're here. Um, so yeah, I see the application a lot, and so I would like to share that with you. Um, oops, I'm on the wrong slide. This is the slide. This slide. <laughs> okay. So, um, one of the questions that I get asked quite a bit is what kind of students are we looking for? And I think we've talked a lot about the kind of students that we're looking for. You've kind of seen the vision of Sattler and what we're about. Um, the thing that we are most excited about, so there are kind of two components to, to the kind of student we're looking for. We're looking for students who want to be discipled and have a vision for the kingdom. So want to see, want to see um, the nation of God expand, want to expand the church, want to use their skills 
um, the skills that God has given them to further the church and want to kind of hone those skills. Um, yeah, who are just really passionate about their faith, about sharing their faith with others, and about growing in that in an intentional way. And the other thing is we want students who are academically prepared. Um, yeah, so we want you to kind of be ready on both fronts to then use all of those skills, not kind of in this way that kind of separates like career and like your faith as like these two things you hold in different hands, but in things that are ways that you can serve the Lord. Um, so those are the kind of students that we're most interested in. Um, if that describes you, you're the kind of student that we're looking for. Um, so the application process, the application process works. You fill out an initial application. Um, there is no application fee. So I always tell students that they should 100% apply. Like there's no reason not to apply. Um, if you are thinking about it, it's not like starting an application is kind of saying like, this is where I'm going to be for the next four years. I've decided and I'm sure it's just the first step on the road to opening it up as an option for you. Um, so if you're interested, you should start an application. Um, and then after you submit that initial application, there will be kind of two, you'll be required to write two essays. Um, you're, yeah, you'll be required to write two essays um, to submit scores from a standardized test um, and then to have an in-person interview the in, the inter or over Zoom. Um, the interview usually lasts about an hour, about 45 minutes to an hour, and it's really our time to kind of see. We don't just want to know who you are on paper. On paper, that's kind of a good way for us to evaluate your academic preparation, but the thing we are, again, the thing that we are most passionate about is students who kind of share that same vision, who have a desire to see the church grow and have a desire to like put themselves to the service of the church and to the service of Jesus. Um, so that's hard to see from a paper. So we want to talk to you. We want to know what you're about, where you've been, where you're going, um, and how you think Sattler can help you get there. So the application process is probably, a, it's the interview process is a really key part of that. Um, yeah, so finances. Um, Dr. Caravella talked about this. Fin cost is one of our three C's. Um, we kind of have this saying, and we have kind of held it very true, that no one who wants to come to Sattler and is prepared to come to Sattler should ever think that finances will prevent them from being here. Yeah, we will, I think it's Zach's favorite phrase, we will move mountains to get you here because we don't want cost to stand in the way of preparing someone to be of service to Jesus, to prepare them to, yeah, like that's not something where we want cost to stand in the way. And so there will also be kind of one-on-ones for finances offered later, but I can give like a general overview of finances. Um, so tuition is $37,000 per year. Room and board is $16,070, and fees are $450, which leads to an estimated, if you add in things like transportation, books, fees, that leads to an estimated co total cost of attendance of $56,000, right, which is like a large number. And I always get worried that people will see that number, and they will not believe the statement that I made before about how we will move mountains to get you here. <laughs> so there's, um, so right off the bat so our average aid is actually over the numbers over this is thirty eight thousand dollars per year so there's two ways so every student kind of immediately gets twenty seven thousand dollars in a scholarship just because from like their baseline academic scholarship but there's two kinds of um financial aid there's need-based and there's merit-based aid so need-based aid is based on your financial situ your individual financial situation um that looks different for everyone. So that means some people get more need-based aid, some people get less need-based aid. Um, and then there's merit-based, and that's based on things such as prior life experience, things that you've done, and also um, your academic preparation and scores. So a combination of all of those things leads most of our students to have an average aid package of about $38,000, which greatly reduces their cost of attendance. But again, if you're still thinking, that's not enough reduction, we work with each family individually. We don't kind of just sit down. We're not a giant university who kind of sits down and looks at a sheet and goes like, okay, like this is how much money we're going to give them. We hope they can figure it out. We are really committed to getting you here if this is the place where you should be. Um, yeah, so next steps. So again, next steps would be if you haven't started an application, start an application. Um, and yeah, and also ask questions. Um, if you have questions, ask them. We are more than happy to answer them, connect you with people who you should be connected to. If you need more information about like the biblical and religious studies program, if you need more information about the biology program, like is this good preparation for what I'm trying to do? We can connect you to those resources. Again, our goal is to equip people for service to Jesus and his kingdom. And 
we want you to be in the place where you will be best equipped. So we're here to work with you to kind of make sure that you're kind of looking at all the angles of where that place could be and if that place is Sattler or not. Um, yeah, I guess I will. That's what I have. I invite you, um, if you have questions, to join us at one. There will be kind of a space to ask questions. Um, and yeah, both admissions and financial aid related. Um, should I go over again? By and large, our average student pays about, for tuition and room and board, so this is like tuition, food, and housing for an entire year um, or for 10 months, they on average pay, I think last time I checked, it was about $16,000 a year. Um, some students pay more than, actually that number's incorrect because I'm just subtracting it from the total cost of attendance. So that number even includes like, so like for instance, married students do not have room and board costs. So their financial aid it looks lower on paper because they're, they don't have room and board cost. Um, and I mean, yeah, so, so something less than $16,000 a year is what our average student is paying. All right, I'll turn it back over to Zach unless- How do you apply? Yeah, so you apply by going on the website. Um, so you can either apply this afternoon or you apply by going on the website um, and there is a giant apply button in the upper right-hand corner or by going to sattlercollege.org slash apply. Thank you. All right, I'm going to invite, there's a uh, Professor Lamasilla. All right, we're going to sing some pop, some songs and move into lunchtime here. But we've, there's been no small of, amount of debate on how to actually market the cost. I'll just say a couple of things. We started by saying it costs $9,000 to attend Sattler. But there were some like, oh, that's a cheap, that's a cheap, institution like you guys are probably hiring nobodies and providing a really terrible education so we switch and say all right this is what it really costs and this is how we break our backs on the other end to make it possible and so that those are those numbers worst case scenario it's twenty thousand dollars a year if you did the math fifty six thousand minus thirty eight comes around somewhere to eighteen thousand so and every student who applies and is accepted gets a twenty seven thousand dollar grant per year $27,000 times four is, any any math, quick math for people, 108, is that right? 108,000, if you don't apply, you lose $108,000, that's it, all right, that's it, all right. Good to see all of you. So one of the things that we do here every day every school day, so between Monday and Friday, is we have a time called tea time. And so basically what it is is for a short block of time, around 15, 20, 30 minutes or so, um, there's no classes, everyone gathers over here, and usually we sing two songs, and then usually uh, one of the faculty or a student, um, sometimes a visitor, will share a pearl. So basically like some lesson, some uh, bit of wisdom, some uh, something that's edifying and encouraging to the, the student body. So two songs and a little pearl and then a couple announcements and it's sort of a, a time every day for everyone to gather and um, yeah, just for all of us to, to be together and to, to be uh, edified together. So there's no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna give you a pearl today. You've, you've probably uh, seen and heard enough, enough people speaking, but we will sing uh, two songs. So songbooks underneath the chairs and we'll start with 190. Yeah, if you can, uh, I invite you to stand, and we'll we'll sing together. One hundred ninety, Ferris, Lord Jesus. Hmm. Ferris, Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature. Oh. 
The other song we'll sing is 375, Be Thou My Vision. It always seems like there are certain songs, and it, it kind of changes from year to year and even semester to semester, but there's always certain songs that we sing a lot at tea time. And I think this one might be a little bit less this year than it has before, but I, I feel like Be Thou My Vision is a song that we've sung here a lot. So, little little taste of Sattler. 375. We'll sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. So we'll skip verse 3. Hmm. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best heart by day. We're about to have lunch, but I know I had everyone introduce themselves. Would, would you mind introducing yourselves right here? The, the couple, of, yeah. What well, just where who you are, where you come, from, where you came from, and maybe why you're why you're here. Okay, I like it. Me too. All right, and then I know you have an announcement. Why don't you announce before we go to prayer? Yeah. Okay. So um, there will be at two, it's on your agenda, but there will be a Christian history walking tour. So it's like an amazing tour because Manila really does a really great job giving that tour. Um, it's optional. If you want to go, just sign up here um, and then include one phone number for family just so that we don't leave you. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in going, it'll be in the second floor lobby, but this will be by the front desk with a pen so that you can sign up if you're and I just want to point out our director of IT, Clark Ray, here, doing wonders behind the scenes. Everyone give it up for, for wow. Mr. Ray here. And then, Clark, do you think you could pray for the meal before for all of us? I know I don't want to put you on the spot, but yeah. Together and your bounties and your harvest, we ask that you 
bless it, bless our, our fellowship and our time together, that we might all uh, be as iron sharpens iron to equip one another for, for the battle in the world of, of spiritual forces and for the, the, the mission that you have for us here on earth. We love you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I am back. So, um, there's Chick-fil-A. There was kind of like a setup in a line for like all of the